Well, hi everyone. Hello. Hello. I'm your cleanup batter for today. <laughs> so, in the spirit of, in that spirit, I'm going to just do something completely different from everything you've heard so far. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk today about partnerships, partnering relationships, relationships, and how to make these work better. Now. This issue of partnerships or strategic alliances and B2B, this is something that everybody pretty much universally says is important. So a, re a recent, well, it wasn't actually recent, but it's pretty timeless. Um, so the CMO Council ran a survey, and 85% of the respondents said, yeah, B2B alliances, collaboration, it's definitely important. But when you peel back the onion a little and you look underneath, what you realize and what they learned in this survey is that the same respondents admitted that 43% of their partnerships will fail, okay? They also admitted that 42% of their partnerships are under leveraged, under resourced, and they're not getting the ROI, ROI that they want from it. 45% cannot maintain a long-term successful relationship, and more than two-thirds of them do not even have Formal partnering strategy in place. So this, this is mind blowing. And what I've found over the years, and what I'm going to share with you about today, is that a lot of times the reason why this happens so systematically is because a lot of us really don't understand the squishy side of business, right? Many people will tell me, you know, 50% of business is relationship. 50% is the quantitative piece. When you look at what we teach in MBA programs, it's all the quantitative piece, right? Are you gonna make money or not? Nobody in an MBA program is gonna teach you about how to manage the relationship. And yet, you know, there's a lot of science behind how to manage relationships. And that's what we'll talk about today. Now here's an interesting factoid. A lot of people like to talk to me about their alliances and their partnerships as being you know marriages and and i'm gonna by the end of this talk you'll see very clearly there's a very terrible metaphor to use but you know what's interesting is the fact that we have relationship skills or relationship experience in our personal lives actually also doesn't really even trans translate over to the business situation in fact how many of you know probably everybody knows this what's what's the average divorce rate not just in America, but on average, it hasn't changed for decades. Who knows what that percentage is? Is it 42? It's 50%. Yeah. Exactly. It's random chance. Now, here's a harder question. What is the divorce rate for the second year? It's about 25. No, not 25. <laughs> it goes up to 60%. And how about for the third marriage? 90%. <laughs> <laughs> you would be, Jerry. Even Jerry would be broke. 73% for the third marriage. Right? So what does this tell us, right? This tells us, okay, that experience does not make us wiser. It only makes you older, right? That's what it is. So let's let's move in the direction of wisdom today. So you know, one of my favorite um, examples to talk about when we think about why it is that so many close relationships, business relationships, fail. One of my favorite examples is Google and Samsung because I think this example clearly demonstrates exactly what the properties are and what the, the phenomenon is here that I'm going to be talking about. So Google and Samsung, they were a great partnership, right? They are currently and have been for many years the number one market share for cell phones in the world, okay? They beat Apple's butt, and they did it because of their collaboration together, their partnership. And, you know, one key ingredient that they had, and this is actually something my dissertation research showed, is that each of them had a different competency. They had something that the other needed, right? One is manufacturing and the other one is software. You put these two things together, the pie expands. Everybody is better off. This is great. So <coughs> as a result of this, ad revenues went through the roof, 
phone revenues went through the roof. All is great. Everybody is happy. But it's exactly when you're this successful that the problems will start to creep in. So what happened is that, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. You know, I got this, um, I got a flu shot the other day. I've never had a reaction. Next thing I know, now I'm sick from a flu shot. And Gary Lillian tells me this is because I'm getting OLD. I'm like, well, oh, I'm gonna play the fifth on that. But um, Google is worried that Samsung may be getting too big for the britches, may want a larger share of the pie. So what did they do? <coughs> Sorry. As a good partner, they went out, they paid $12.5 billion, they acquired Motorola, a competitive manufacturer, mobile set manufacturer. And of course, Samsung then responded with, okay, you're gonna get a replacement manufacturer? I'm gonna get, thank you, a replacement software. So they um, started to create Tizen, which is an open source software to replace Android. Ultimately, <clears throat> what happened over the next two years is they agreed to a ceasefire where um, Google then sold off Motorola and then Samsung then um, said, we're gonna limit Tizen to our television sets and not our, hands, our phones anymore. What's interesting is that a year later, I was in um, South Korea and I met with um, the strategy, the head of strategy at Samsung. And I was there with a group of students <coughs> and, I, um, and I asked them, I said, you know, you don't have to answer this question, but would you care to comment on how that partnership with Google is going? He was a British guy and most British, people that I know seem to be very put together and polite. And he turned red in the face. He started sputtering and he just started saying all these things. You know, I kind of expected that, you know, he would maybe say something like, oh, you know, yeah, you know, we're continuing to work together and it, it's moving along, you know, but he couldn't even say that. He just got upset. He started sputtering. And I was like, oh, he is still in that emotional state. So, you know, it dug deep into the firms. And this whole thing is what I like to refer to as frenemization. So what, the way this works is you've got two partners. They do extremely well. They're able to expand the pie of benefits between them. But then a poison creeps in and, mm -hmm. and this thing starts to dissolve. Let me tell you about a couple more examples. There are lots of visible examples. Some of the latest, we've just heard about FedEx and Amazon who have had a falling out. Recently, um, Google has hired um, the head of Oracle's product development. That was also just recently in the news. Some classic examples that I love to teach about in class, we talk about the Calvin Klein and Warnico case. So Calvin Klein and Warnico, they they built the underwear, Calvin Klein underwear business from 55 million, and within five years, they grew that business six times, $350 million worth of underwear. That's a lot of underwear, right? How many of you have partners that have grown your revenues six times, right? Well, <clears throat> the great thing about this case, so they went to court, and you know how the business press described this partnership in court? They said the two companies were like Siamese twins who were scratching out their mutual heart. That is a horrible visual, right? I mean, you don't want that to be said about your company, but that's exactly how they were described. It was so ugly. Apple and Samsung over copyright issues. So um, I, I have colleagues who have become very, very wealthy as a part of the expert, being an expert witness in that case. When we look at um, Northwestern and KLM, one of the first alliances to open up the pan-European um, routes between Detroit and um, Europe. And um, at the time, Northwestern, Northwest was saved. Um, they were run by a couple of um, venture capitalist firms 
And but the culture clash between them and KLM was so horrible that at one point, when KLM tried to inject them with some money to help stabilize them, Northwest was so threatened that they said, you know, publicly, they said, I don't care what those guys think. So that, you know, KLM could wrap themselves in all the tool leaves they want, but we're not taking their money. Like, you know, so this is like frenemization. Mobileye and Tesla, right? This is just prior to the Tesla self-driving crash. Mobileye had been warning Tesla, do not advertise this car <laughs> as being self-driving. It's not safe. You're not there yet. But Tesla went ahead and did it anyway. That partnership broke up. If you've been listening to or watching this case of Elizabeth Holmes with Theranos and Walgreens, right? That's clearly a situation where Walgreens, you know, trusted but didn't bother to verify. There's a little too much trust there with them. And then of course, poor Martha. She did not know that when you sign an exclusive agreement with one retailer, you are not allowed to then sell your goods to JCPenney, okay? <laughs> so this created a rift as well. And of course, we all know Costco. Costco is always kicking out their partners. They kicked out Amex. And now, God be, who could believe this, especially if for people in Atlanta, they actually kicked Coke out of their food court and replaced it with Pepsi. That's like a crime. So we all know, we all know of um, partner, partnering frenemies. We all know examples of this. And I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of this hit very close to home for you. I know that when I was writing this book, I would tell people, okay, you know, I'm writing this book on this topic of partnering frenemies and I'd explain, you know, here's what I think a frenemy is. And have you ever seen that? And every person I talked to universally would say, yes, absolutely. Let me tell you about this, blah, blah, blah. And then I would say, that's an amazing story. Can I publish that? No, okay. So I, it's something that, that we know, we experience. Um, it's kind of the dirty laundry of business to business. So. What I'd like to do, though, is kind of explain like how this happens, right? And more importantly, what can we do about it? So there's a, there's a common spiral that happens here. For example, if you look at the Nike Foot Locker partnership, right, they built the um, tennis shoe industry, right, into basically a $16 billion pie together. I mean, this is unbelievable. They were both extremely well off. This is exactly what your partnerships should be doing. What happens? Well, at some point, Foot Locker starts to be dissatisfied about rigid pricing terms in their contract. And so they say, you know, you're not giving us enough selection. You don't like these prices. So therefore, we're going to start dropping our prices and running sales on your products which of course hurts the brand. And Nike, you know, like all good products, like all good partners, they say, okay, well then we're gonna cut your orders by about 15 to 25%, and this just adds more fuel to the fire. So then what does Foot Locker do? They say, well, you know, we're just gonna drop your shipments by 40%, um, or I'm sorry, Nike says, we're gonna drop your shipments by 40%, we're gonna withhold our top sellers from you. And then, but Locker says, okay, we'll drop our prices even more so we can boost sales. And in fact, this is the spiral that happens often, and it happens repeatedly. And because of this, the two partners become increasingly alienated, the partnership falls apart, and this is why we now see stores like Nike Town. Nike Town is completely the result of Nike not being able to to incentivize Foot Locker to give the level of service and attention and education that Nike desires for its top sellers. So because they could never coordinate that well enough through Foot Locker, they had to vertically integrate it, they had to do it themselves. And of course, Foot Locker never received their top end best sellers, latest, you know, tieless um, shoe models, things like that, okay? So all of this, again, falls out of it. So what I'd like to do is um, tell you, share with you a little bit about what some of the research says about managing relationships between organizations. There is actually a lot of science in how this is done. 
it's an area of research that I've been looking at for almost 30 years now. Um, and um, I'm going to share with you like some, some principles or insights that I like to call the laws of relationship physics. Okay, so this is me um, with my investigative lens on. And, um, and I'm going to share with you some findings from some of my co-authors as well in terms of what we found in terms of principles and insights for managing relationships better. And by the way, if you have any questions, comments at all, you don't have to wait till the end. Please feel free to just interject at any point. Okay, here we go. So the general cycle begins something like this. So frenemization always starts with you've got a great, you've got a great um, partnership going on. And then what almost always happens is the fact that you're successful together, this inevitably creates a level of dependence upon each other, right? If we think of Google and Samsung, I mean, the only reason why they were making the levels of returns that they did was because they were somewhat dependent. And that feeling of dependence on a partner, that much dependence on a partner brings a lot of insecurity. And so what happens is um, research has shown that firms will start to counterbalance that, right? Nobody likes to feel, no firm likes to feel too dependent on the partner. So you start doing things to counterbalance that. You go out and find most often a replacement for that partner. But that, all that does is it breeds suspicions. So as soon as you start doing that, your partner's like, what are you, what's going on here, right? There's something, you must, you must be up to something, there's something wrong. And so then, even if you never talk about it, right, just the suspicion alone will lead to vilification. And, and so then what happens is that partners start to change the way they interact with each other. Maybe they start withdrawing a little bit. And that just makes it worse. So you get into this downward spiral. And um, this is how most relationships will either end or, in the case of Google and Samsung, you'll get this hostile ceasefire somewhere in between. So this is the spiral that inevitably happens. It's very predictable. It's very observable. You've probably seen this yourself. Now, what do we do about this? Or how can we learn more from this? So as we think about relationship physics, let's start first with this concept of trust. So everybody tells me, you know, when I say, what's the most important ingredient in your business relationships? People always say, Trust. Trust is so important. Okay, but you know, here's where the faulty thinking comes in. Many people think of trust as a bank account, right? So you build trust by making these big deposits into your partner's bank account, right? I'm here to tell you today that that is completely wrong, okay? Stop thinking about trust as a bank account. What you need to think about trust or understand about trust is trust is not like a currency it's more like a liquid so if you think about a bathtub how many of you take baths some people like to soak and take baths it's and they tell me it's a luxury i'm not one of those people but if you think about it think about the water in a bathtub which happens more quickly the filling of the water in the bathtub or the draining of the water from that bathtub? How many of you would say it's the filling that's faster? No takers for the filling. We got a few. We got a few. We got, I'm seeing three now. Okay. How many of you would say it's the draining that's faster? We have more of that. How many of you just have no freaking idea? <laughs> All right. So the answer is, it's the draining that happens faster, okay? Now this is exactly the properties of trust. It takes, a long, it takes longer to build, but it's quickly and easily lost. And this is really important because this tells you that you cannot treat trust like a bank account. You can't go and just make a huge deposit into your partner's bank of trust. So, and let me show you exactly why. Here's the implication. If you think of trust as a bank account, 
then you're going to think that you can just even occasionally make a big deposit into that bank account. And it should be pretty effective if, if trust is a currency. Here's an example. Suppose, this is a metaphor, okay? But suppose your partner really appreciates fresh cut flowers, okay? Some people really love receiving fresh cut flowers. It makes the place smell great. It, may, it brightens up a corner. Other partners would say, you know, that is the biggest waste of money because that stuff just dies in two days. That's temporary. That is not a good way to, you know, to build trust or show affection. So imagine that when you have a partnership like this, one likes flowers, the other one thinks it's a waste of money. And then the partner comes home one day and brings this huge, massive bouquet of broom. Okay? Now, if trust is like a bank account, right, then that partner has just made a massive deposit into the bank account, right? And everybody should be happy. But what happens instead? The partner's reaction is exactly the opposite, right? And again, it's because trust is not like a bank account, right? You can't just come along and make this huge deposit and everything is okay. In fact, I would argue that these grand gestures make things worse in terms of building trust, right? Instead, the way you win back trust is by smaller, more consistent gestures. So the mechanism that's at work, the reason why this doesn't work is because this kind of gesture, not only is it because trust is not like a bank account, but it's also because, you know, this kind of thing exceeds a person's expectations. It exceeds it so much that people, it makes people uncertain and then they don't trust it anymore, right? So if you want to win someone back and build the trust, you win them back with smaller actions, okay? Maybe it means cooking the dinner, making the kids one evening, emptying the dishwasher, picking up your clothes. You know, these are smaller things that are a little bit more believable, but that win back the trust little by little, okay? So if you think of this, and uh, if you're a business partner who you just will never, ever give a price discount, under any circumstance. And then one day you come in and you tell your partner, yeah, you know, okay, I'll give you a big price discount. They're gonna be suspicious, right? They're and you know, you're better to do other things that are closer to their expectations than to do something really big. And it will backfire because trust is not like a bank account. Let's move on. The other thing to think about is to think about um, your partner expectations. I, I think most partnerships fail because when you start a partnership, most partners do not like to have a talk about what to expect. And most partners do not really understand what are the timelines and the priorities of my partner, okay? So what you need instead is you, every partnership needs to start off with what I call a map. And so when you start a new partnership, or if you have a partnership in place, you need to talk about a couple of critical issues. Some critical issues that should be discussed up front so that everybody understands how are we going to address these things are things like how are we going to resolve conflict, conflict? how will changes and assumptions be dealt with, what about any kind of investing imbalances? Are we okay with that? You know, do we think that's going to even out over time, or is it how long is this going to be around for? Um, and how often should we be in communication? And who should be in communication? Right? Is it the people who started the partnership, the people above them, the people below them? Right? And how often? These kinds of expectations are important for both parties to understand. Just operationally, how are we going to carry this out, right? Remember this, it's not enough to just have a promise and a party. Partnerships are very celebratory. People like to, you know, hey, let's announce this new partnership. Woo-hoo, you know, let's throw a party. That is not sufficient for making the partnership work, right? It's the brass tacks. It's the conversations that happen before. It's
it's how you actually execute that that matter more. This alone is not sufficient in terms of developing and creating the capability that you need for the long run. All right, let me give you another um, insight into relationships. Many people um, don't realize that relationships, business relationships have a life cycle. In the same way that our products have life cycles, business relationships also evolve and develop in the same way. And we can think of the life cycles of a relationship as something like this. So, so on the horizontal axis, um, we have time, and then on the vertical axis, we have, let's say, your performance evaluations of your partner. And what happens is that early on, those evaluations are low as you're getting to know each other, but if that time is successful, and maybe you start to build up and create commitments, larger purchase orders, more investments, you know, a wider range of products being ordered, um, then these performance evaluations will improve over time until it'll peak at a state of maturity. And then over time, as the partnership no longer works, um, these evaluations will drop as well. It's the same curve that we see with product life cycles in terms of sales. Now, what's interesting about this is you can, you can think about how partnerships actually evolve here. In other words, do partnerships that follow these phases systematically and predictably, do they do better than partnerships that don't, right? And this is a question we asked in one study. And here's what we found. So we surveyed thousands of distributors, okay? Um, and um, this was actually in the farming industry. And um, what we did is, we said, hold on, let me just, yeah. And what we did is we asked them, to what extent um, did your relationship, like what's your relationship stage now and what was it five years ago? Okay, that's the question, so we asked them. So they really had no idea what we were, we were after here. And then we plotted out basically where they were now versus where they were five years ago. And we try to understand five years ago to now, did they appear to be moving this way in a systematic way through kind of like a, a healthy evolution of their relationship? Or five years ago versus today, does it look like they kind of regressed and maybe went back? So maybe, you know, today we're in a state of maturity, but, you know, what we've tried to do is we've tried to go back and, or maybe today we're in a state of exploration, but five years ago we were in a state of maturity, right? So this is kind of like trying to rebuild, reconfigure, or do the past over, right? That's the idea behind the red lines versus um, the blue. And what you see is that for those relationships that progress according to this life cycle, 76% of them, they had higher performance valuations of their partners, and those that actually regress over the past five years actually perform systematically and statistically lower, right? They had lower evaluations of the partner. So what does this mean? It means that your past history has a very heavy bearing on your evaluations today of your partner. In other words, how you got to this point with that, with that partner says a lot and matters a lot to your performance evaluation of that partner today. In other words, another way to think about this is that it's difficult to rebuild because there is no forgetting, right? So if you have conflicts, if you have a hard time with a partner and you say, well, let's just clean the slate and try again. If there was a breach of trust, um, if there was disappointment, then trying to just say, well, let's just try again and do it better in the future doesn't really work, okay? The past takes a heavy toll on the present. So what that means then is if it's hard to get over a bad past, then the solution has to be that you then move away, you cut the ties with that particular partner and you move on. 
Okay. Now, in the cold light of day, that's very seemingly rational. But what I often find with most executives is that most companies, most managers do not feel comfortable with saying goodbye. And they don't know how to say goodbye, and they don't know how to move on, right? And again, this isn't something we really teach in an MBA program. So what we want to learn, really, is we want to kind of learn how do we lose our friends without influencing people, right? So many of you are old enough to remember that book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Well, I always say you need to learn how to lose your friends without influencing people. So here's what I mean. As an example, let's think about Cisco. And so in the high tech space, the high tech space is, a, is an industry where you see lots and lots of these um, partnerships coming together, dissolving, right? So it, the industry is moving very rapidly. People are, and organizations are forming partnerships all the time, but they're dissolving them rapidly. And there has to be, in, in order to do this well, you have to be able to say goodbye easily. So here's the way you say goodbye. And it's actually, and you know, when someone points this out to you, it's sort of like, oh, well, yeah, that makes sense, right? But if you've never done it, you, you may not have thought about this. The first thing is to ask yourself, what are the advantages or disadvantages of terminating, right? Do the cost and benefit analysis, we really need to terminate, right? Then the next thing to do is to think about the mutual customers. Who gets impacted as the partnership breaks apart? Right? Mutual customers, distributors, intermediaries, wholesalers, suppliers. Who's impacted? How? Right? Then together, the two of you, you really need to thoroughly work through all the possibilities and agree on what's going to be said to all these stakeholders about the breakup. How's it going to be presented? How's it going to be resolved? Who do they get migrated over to in, in, in terms of not impacting them? Okay, and then for each one, work on, here's a potential solution, right, for them. You always want to part as friends, because most industries are so small that you never know when you may have to work together again. And not only that, but you don't want to be the bad partner, because after you say goodbye, when that partner goes on to somebody else, right, they're going to tell them what kind of partner you work with. Okay? So you always want to manage the goodbyes well. But the important thing is to not be afraid of saying goodbye. And this is why I always say, stop using this marriage metaphor when we talk about partnerships, right? We are not in a marriage with our supplier or our distributor, right? Our partnership is not a marriage, right? And the reason why I don't like that is because the goal of most marriages is oftentimes, or at least historically, both monogamy and length of time, right? So you are rewarded for how long you stay together and for how long you stay with only that partner. But in business, it's all, that's completely wrong, right? You stay together for the mutual value, not the length of time, right? You stay together for, and, and monogamy in business is a very bad thing. You should always be looking at alternative partners all the time, right? You always have to understand what's the alternative out there. So I would say, if you don't remember anything from this talk, please just stop talking about your partners as your married partners, right? Because the problem with that too is that it becomes very hard to say goodbye, right? Then all of a sudden, if your partner has always been, if you've always been married to your partner, the only way you say goodbye is through a divorce, right? And divorces are never happy and it hurts the kids, right? So no more marriage metaphors. If you want to use a personal relationship metaphor, I would say think of your partnerships as dates, long-term dates, short-term dates, right? When the value is gone, you move on, right? It's mutual. And hopefully it's not ugly, but it's possible. Okay, here's some more suggestions on getting good at saying goodbye. So think it through individually with your partner. What are the possible endings <laughs> in saying goodbye? How will people be affected? 
And, you know, if you haven't talked to your partner about it, talk to them. Because I would say that if you're thinking about dissolving a partnership, you'd be surprised. Your partner might be thinking about it too, right? Sometimes it's pretty mutual when you both know, okay, the value sort of ending here. And then again, and nicely. Now, a lot, of, a lot of firms will ask me, okay, Sandy, you know, that's great. I understand why we're breaking apart. I understand the dynamics, and I understand that you know, trust is not a bank account. But what does work in partnerships? You know, is there any golden bullet? If I had to do one thing or get one thing right in my partnership, what would it be? And I would say, this is what it is. The one thing, now this, by the way, is only for highly strategic, high stakes, important partnerships, okay? This, this is the one thing you can do to bulletproof it. The one thing you can do is for both parties to create mutual investments, okay? Put some skin in the game. Now, it's not just any skin, right? It's a, it has to be certain type of investments that matter. So economists call this mutual investments, they call it a, a credible commitment, or they call it the time of the hands, all right? Um, because the idea is that both partners get in there and they take some risks for each other. So you might be um, putting in capital equipment, maybe some personnel that are specifically dedicated to a partner, maybe some specific, you know, logistic handling strategies, distribution strategies, you know, product inventory, RFID um, strategies. You might have specific implicit understandings that you create specifically for one partner, right? Now, the important thing about these matching investments is they must be what economists call non-fungible, okay? In other words, they must be something that is specific to a partner and you can't take it out and easily transfer it somewhere else, right? So money is fungible, right? I can, I can give Lori here $100,000, but then I could potentially take that out and just transfer $100,000 to somebody else, right? But if we have specific people, warehouses, equipment that's dedicated to optimize our joint performance, then that's not so easy. That's, that becomes non-fungible. And so if you look in the auto industry, what you see is you see like this revolution in 3D printing, right? And many 3D manufacturing companies are working with auto, um, automobile manufacturers to come up with components in the printing of components that are specifically optimized for a specific manufacturer and a specific car, right? So that's what I mean by an investment that is non-fungible, okay? It's specifically tied to that partner. And the reason why this works is because it requires both sides to forego alternative um, possibilities, opportunities, and importantly, it lines the incentives of both parties. Now, both parties are incented to act on their mutual behalf do what's best for the fur for both of them. Like do whatever is best for both parties and don't screw each other, right? That's usually what you require from a good partner. Don't screw me and do what's good for both of us, right? And that's what these investments do. So I would say if there's anything powerful, a golden bullet, I would say it's this. And I'll tell you that um, in a lot, I have a lot of research that shows, you know, this is so powerful that this is better than contracts. It's better than coming up with a bunch of joint goals that we all agree on, right? It's better than just, you know, developing work norms that increase our, our cooperation. All those things are not as effective as real money, foregone opportunities, and real risks that are targeted specifically towards a partner, okay? But you wanna save this for your most important partnerships. Right? and the ones that are mutual, not the ones where you have more invested than the other or you have less invested. Okay, so we're gonna wrap up here a little bit. I wanna make time for questions. Um, so what we've seen today is this idea of trust, 
the trust takes time to build. It's not like a bank account. You can't just make some big investment and have a lot of trust and everybody's happy. You win trust in smaller gestures, not grand gestures. That just makes things worse. We have said that you start partnerships off right, first by talking about the relationship, setting expectations so that everybody knows how and when we will interact and how long we're thinking about what would possibly change our priorities with each other and how we will work together specifically. We will either try to avoid having a bad history, but having had it, we can remember that, you know what? It's really hard to recover from, and if we can, maybe we should be looking for alternative partners. And as we look for alternative partners, you're going to very nicely say goodbye, move on, and for those partners who are very, very important, very, very special, we will put the money, time, and effort into keeping them and aligning the incentives to make that work. Right? Okay. So this, and of course, many more specifics um, are available, as Rob said, in my book, where we talk about this and we go into greater detail and you know, provide more tools, um, and that's available for you as well. So with that, let me just open it up to um, any kind of questions, comments, observations, I'm always interested in hearing what you say. Ask, I mean, you showed the death spiral, and um, and then you're saying, well, you know, bad history poison stay, so move away. But what if you're in, let's say, some earlier stage of the death spiral, right? You're not yeah. at the end, yeah. maybe somewhere in the middle, yeah. or somewhere in the early stage. I mean, can you turn it around? And how yes. Do you turn it around? Yeah, absolutely. You can. Well, first, you ask yourself the question: Do I want this to turn around? Do I need it to turn around? Is it important? to save this, right? Um, and if the answer to all of those things are yes, then I think you start to ask yourself, and you can think about this checklist. Well, you know, have we talked about our expectations? You know, it, is some of the problems due to the fact that maybe, you know, we have different expectations of how this should work or how we should be working together, right? So you could go back and you could be thinking about that. Um, you could be thinking about, are we communicating enough and often enough and in a way that's working for us? And you also should be at that point saying, okay, well, well where do, do I want this to be? And what am I needing or expecting from my partner to get us there, right? So if you're going to do an intervention at that point, you want it to kind of make sure it moves towards the right direction. Okay? Yes, Jen. I think that, um, you know, especially in the case of purchasing, there is a desire to take out all the emotions and to make it completely rational about the numbers, right? Um, but, you know, we all know that half of business is actually relational. And the reality is that we are human agents that are involved in this economic transaction, right? And as humans, we are prone to um, both, you know, certain psychological tendencies, but we're also prone to the emotions. And I will tell you that oftentimes, it, especially in business to business, it is the relationships that will often differentiate one supplier or one customer from the other, 
right? So relationships are important um, from a differential standpoint. And oftentimes that gets translated um, in a purchasing context into, into real money. So, um, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is that even in purchasing, I think you want to, you want to um, warm that up and allow the relationships to come back in, right? But particularly for contracts, customers, and situations where it's potentially important to you from an economic standpoint, right? You don't want to warm up all relationships because it takes a lot of effort and resource, right? But you want to, um, but for those that are really important, you, you want to cultivate the relationship in there because it does help to differentiate you, right? Does that help or I'm not sure if it's going exactly to your answer. Okay. Yeah, it does. I think that's, that's what we have to do in practice. Um, you run into the uh, robotic anti-racial Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what we're trained to do, right? That's what, that's what business school teaches us. And, and, you know, but we all know, right? You all do business and you know that it's not completely 100% rational. We're not pure economic agents. We're humans too. It's kind of describing that. Okay, this is related to the last question. It doesn't mean like the account relationships. Do you think that there are there differences? Oh, huge, huge. And in fact, um, and we're going to talk about um, this class that I mean that I'll be offering to ISBM members. But one thing we do in, in my um, I teach channel strategy. I've taught it for 25 years. And one thing that we do is we actually have a framework where we kind of evaluate this whole issue. Um, I think one of the speakers today talked about um, relationships and the importance of having, you know, whining and dining your clients and things like that. And that's something that you want to do, but you only want to do it when it matters. And I will tell you that empirically, most people have like too much relationship love in their business relationships, okay? And let me, and let me explain what I mean by that. So I actually have a framework that I teach my students where what we do is we try to, um, we set like, you know, on a graph, um, you know, how warm is our relationship from a, you know, whining and dining and um, trust perspective versus the economic potential of that relationship. And what we see, I will tell you, class after class after class, we have way too much warm relationships, okay, for the economic potential it's actually there. <laughs> Right. So what, what you really want to do is you want to be smarter about how and when to have a relationship. And so that's why I was saying to Jen, you know, you want to do it with the contracts that matter the most, where you've got high stakes in there um, and, and or, you know, some sort of differential deal. What people often forget, we're in a culture now where most organizations have, you know, relationship manager titles and they want, you know, it's all about having good relationships. But I will tell you, developing good relationships is a costly resource. So you really want to use it strategically. It's not for everybody. And I'm a relationship person. I'm very pro-relationship. But on the other hand, you know, in business, you use it strategically. All right. Any other last? So the last thing that I've been asked to do, since there are no more questions and comments, I'm going to leave it there.